Good morning to all on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. I would like to share some activities coming up in our summer schedule. There's something for all ages. I told the folks at early church the staff usually has a clean calendar for the months of June and July, but not this summer. There's a lot going on. Central's youth mission team has traveled to the Wind River Reservation in Riverton, Wyoming. And this week they will lead in Vacation Bible School each morning, and they'll do construction in the afternoon at Eagle's Hope Shelter. So please keep them in your prayers. And you'll notice it's very quiet at the organ this morning also. Julia is out today, and she's sharing uh, Father's Day with her father this morning, so we'll miss her at the organ. Our senior adult outing to Fayetteville for dinner at the Broadway Diner is Thursday. They're leaving at 5 p.m., and if you would like to make reservations, you may contact the church office. On Saturday, June the 30th, our kids' fishing day will be at David and Deanna McMurrin's Lake near Palmetto. Please bring your own rod and reel if you'd like. There will be some poles there and some bait, but it should be a very good time for families. And the contact person is Steve Maple, and he's here this morning if you'd like to talk to him about that. Our Vacation Bible School is July 9 through 12. Katie would very much appreciate you registering your children and grandchildren if they're planning to attend. And then looking toward the fall, our church will participate in a marriage retreat weekend at Callaway Gardens. This retreat is sponsored by the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Georgia, and we are pushing it this early in the summer because reservations and deposits are requested by July 1. And now as the prelude is played, it is the time to focus your heart and your mind on the presence of God in this place. In Genesis 28, God speaks to Jacob in a dream. And as Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And this morning, surely the presence of God is here in this place, we can feel his mighty power and his grace.
morning. Happy Father's Day and welcome to worship. It's a great day to be at Central Baptist Church. If you happen to be new to Central this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're grateful that you've chosen to spend this hour with us. And I'd like to ask you to do one thing for us while you're here, if you don't mind. I hope you'll take a guest information card from the pew rack in front of you. Take just a moment to fill it out and then drop it in the offering plate as it comes by later in the worship service. We would really love to have a record of your presence this morning so that we can welcome you just a little bit more personally and maybe even share with you some of the things that God is doing in us and through us here at Central Baptist Church. As I remind all of us, most weeks we gather for worship here each week because we believe that the shared experience of God here, a God who we hope is present in this place, the shared experience of God in this place and in this hour has the power to transform us. So my prayer for you this morning and my prayer for me is that God might use this hour to change our lives. I invite you now to join me in reading our call to worship responsibly. Come, worship and praise God together. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Tell stories of God's power and majesty, God's mighty acts throughout history. Remember the compassion God has shown toward us, God's mercy and unfailing love generation after generation. For God's strength and worthy of our grace. Pass these stories along to our children and grandchildren so that they too may come to know and love God. For God is great and worthy of our praise.
please join me in the litany. These are selected verses from the 112th Psalm. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Praise, Praise the Lord. Listen for a word from God to you as I read sacred scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read verses 1 through 10. You can find that passage in your pew Bible on page 1816. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, on Father's Day, we turn to you with gratitude for the fathers in our lives. And as your children, we turn to you grateful for your fatherly presence and for your example. Help us to love as you love, to care as you care, to find in you strength and wisdom, both to be good fathers and to be good children. We remember as we pray and worship this morning our youth missions team. We pray for your presence in their work and for their safe return home. We remember as we pray this morning that all that we are and all that we have is a gift from you, grace, 
not earned, not deserved, not fair, but uncomprehensively generous. Make us generous, too. By the power of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of another day in your creation, another chance to enjoy this life here on earth. You have blessed us with so many gifts, Lord, many that we take for granted. Thank you for our families, our friendships, and our brothers and sisters in this church. And especially on this day of celebration, we thank you for our fathers. Thank you for the fathers that have gone home to you, Lord, that were inspirations to us on how we should conduct our lives. Help us to remember their examples of living and worshiping you as we continue our journey here on earth. Now, as we offer you a portion of the financial gifts you've blessed us with, we ask that you bless these offerings to your glory, that your work may be done in this church and the missions it supports. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
gently call me into your presence, guide me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life through your eyes. I'm captured by. And thank you, Ann. This morning we continue our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, a journey that we're making all summer. Some of you will remember that we started out with our own paraphrase of the sermon. You might want to have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. This is my paraphrase of Matthew 5, 38 through 6, 4. Be generous with those who make requests of you. 
And don't live by the world's standards when it comes to saving face or even preserving your own reputation. Even when you've been wronged or disrespected in ways big and small, let go of your pride. Put whatever happened behind you and move forward with humility. Always strive for perfection in your love for other people. Anyone can love those who are close to them, but you should find ways to love even the people who are most difficult to love. God loves everyone and showers the warmth of God's blessing on all of us equally and without fail. You should try to love like that, too. Don't always be the one to trumpet the good things you do. When you're the one always seeking credit for yourself, people will look for ways to tear you down and expose your weaknesses instead when you find opportunities to be generous. Keep them to yourself. God will know what you've done, and ultimately, it's God's opinion that matters, not what everyone else thinks. <laughs> Be generous. That's our, our message for today. We're reading a lot of Winnie the Pooh at our house right now. We, Julie actually reads Winnie the Pooh to Hudson almost every morning. Uh, this is from the house on Pooh Corner. It's a conversation between Pooh and Rabbit. Pooh was sitting in his house one day, counting his pots of honey, when there came a knock at the door. Fourteen, said Pooh. Come in. Fourteen, or was it fifteen? Father, I'm all muddled now. Well, hello, Pooh, said Rabbit. Hello, Rabbit, said Pooh. Fourteen, wasn't it? Fourteen what, said Rabbit. My pots of honey, what I was counting. Fourteen, that's right, said Rabbit. Are you sure, said Pooh? Well, no, said Rabbit, does it matter? <laughs> I just like to know, said Pooh humbly, so I can say to myself I've got fourteen pots of honey left, <laughs> or fifteen as the case might be. It's sort of comforting. Well, let's call it sixteen then, said Rabbit. <laughs> It is sort of comforting to know how much we've got, isn't it? To know that we've got enough. Actually, it's comforting to know that we've got more than enough. Pooh's right. But Rabbit's right, too. Does it matter? <laughs> if all we're trying to get out of all that we've accumulated, out of all of our pots of honey, is comfort? Why stick with 14 or 15 when we can just pretend that we have 16 and be even more comforted? problem today, though, that our sermon isn't titled, Be Comfortable. <laughs> it's titled, Be Generous. Jesus teaches us to be generous. Generous in our actions, generous, generous in our attitudes, generous in our dealings with other people, generous with our pots of honey. I can't think of a single place where Jesus teaches, Be Comfortable. Switching gears slightly from Winnie the Pooh to the Third Amendment to the Constitution. This is the, this is the U.S. Constitution. Third Amendment. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. That's the Third Amendment to the, to the U.S. Constitution. In colonial times, back when it was still the 13 colonies, when we were still British subjects before the American Revolution, British soldiers stationed in America could show up at your house and demand to be put up for the night. They could. They'd sleep in your bed and they'd eat your food. It was the law that you allowed them to do so. Armies, the British Army, traveled on foot, sometimes very long distances, and in peacetime, often without supply lines, so they would need some supplies. So the law required that you provide them with housing, a place to sit down and eat a meal and rest, maybe a place to wash their clothes. American colonists didn't like this, as you might imagine. They didn't like the burden it put on them. And as they began to resent British rule altogether, they really didn't like it. The reminder that they were under Britain's thumb. Imagine being governed by a foreign power whose troops patrolled your streets in large part to 
keep you under control, to prevent an uprising of any kind, and then imagine those same troops marching into your home and demanding to be put up for the evening. You wouldn't like it either. Colonists didn't like it, so as soon as they won their independence, one of the first things they did is they wrote the Constitution, as they wrote the Bill of Rights, was to write into the Bill of Rights that no one would ever again be required to house troops in their homes. That's the Third Amendment. In Jesus' day, there was a foreign ruling power, right? The Romans. Israel existed very much like a Roman colony with Roman troops living among them, traveling the same roads that the Jews did, largely to keep the population under control to prevent any kind of uprising. And the Romans had a law, too. Their soldiers traveled long distances with heavy packs. It wasn't easy moving the Roman army around Judea. So the law said that a Roman soldier could compel you, a Jewish citizen, to go a mile with them. To walk one mile carrying their packs or helping to move supplies. That was the limit, right? They, they could compel you, but only one mile is what they were allowed to compel you to, to go with them for. Oh, how the Jewish people grew to resent this obligation, this inconvenience, this reminder that they weren't free, that they were under Rome's thumb. In our passage this morning, Jesus says, familiar words, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Be generous, Jesus says. And not generous to just anyone, right? Be generous to the one who's wronged you, to the one who's disrespected you, who's publicly insulted you. Be generous to the one who's slapped you across the face. Be generous to your adversary, to the one who would go so far as to even sue you for your coat. Be generous to that person. And to the Roman soldier who demands that you go one mile. Go two miles with them, Jesus says. Be generous even to them. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You've heard that it was said, be fair. One eye for one eye, that's fair. (laughs) Heard that it was said, be fair. That was the law at the time, the legal standard, right? Fairness. It's the law today, too. It's what we expect. Expect to be treated fairly. When we picture justice, right, we picture a balance. Those scales, right? We picture justice identified as fairness, as reciprocity. But Jesus expressly, specifically, rejects that ethic. Fairness isn't it, Jesus says. That's not the Christian standard. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. You've heard that it was said, be fair. But I say to you, be generous. Eugene Peterson translates today's scripture by having Jesus say, Grow up your kingdom subjects now. Live like it. Stop being childish. Here's a bit of childishness and devotion to fairness. Anyone who's ever tried to evenly divide a treat between Two children, two siblings, say, knows what Jesus means when he perhaps associates a bit of childishness with fairness. What's the complaint when you try to divide something? He got more than me. It's not fair. She got two balloons and I only got one. That's not fair. He got to play longer. She got the bigger piece. He got to stay up later. It's not fair. As adults, that perceived injustice is remembered and carried forward, right? In the next interaction or the next 
transaction, we start to keep very detailed scorecards with remembrances of injustices past. <laughs> One day we can seek to right the way we've been wronged, all in the name of fairness. <laughs> we just want what's fair. But today we're confronted with a passage that directly contradicts that ethic of fairness. And it's not just any passage either, right? These words are written in red. Jesus says, stop asking what's fair. That's the old standard. And start asking, what's the most generous thing I can responsibly do in this situation? Stop asking what's fair and start asking, what's the most generous thing I can responsibly do? To people who are struggling with work or, or to find a job. To people who are having a hard time feeding their family. People who are struggling with health care. People at our border. Not what's fair. It's the most generous thing we could responsibly do. So many of us want so badly to be treated fairly. We want our, we want our work to be rewarded. That's natural. We want our families to be respected. And we don't want our work or our conscientiousness, our attention to detail. We don't want our integrity somehow devalued because others receive what they haven't earned. If it's money or respect or an equal place in society. We want our efforts to be rewarded and set apart appropriately. We want what's fair. Guess what's fair? In Romans, Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. Paul says that's fair. Ephesians, the passage we read together this morning, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's what's fair. You were dead in the water fact that you're not, Paul writes, is pure gift. It is the gift of God. Grace. <laughs> but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. <laughs> and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's not fair. That's better than fair. That's way better than fair. It's generous. <laughs> so should we be generous. If the world were fair, we'd all be condemned. Instead of fair, be generous to others as God is generous to you. Almost exactly three years ago today, a a white gunman walked into a Charleston church, you all remember this, murdered nine African Americans at Bible study in their fellowship hall. He thought he might set off a, a race war, some scorekeeping, some fairness that might escalate into greater and greater levels of violence. That was his goal. He chose the wrong group to walk into. To walk in on what the gunman didn't count on was that he might find some Christians who took the Sermon on the Mount seriously. <laughs> People understood the transformative power of generosity over fairness. Only a day or two after the gunman was arrested, before the funerals had even been conducted, the judge allowed the victims of this tragedy to speak at this man's bond hearing. <laughs> Victims gathered in the courtroom, and they said these words through tears, and I'm quoting. You've hurt a lot of people, but God forgives you, and I forgive you. We have no room, in, no room for hate in our hearts, so we have to forgive you. They went on to quote scripture. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor hate your enemy. 
But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's our passage this morning. That's what we're studying right now. That'll change the world, won't it? Be generous with your possessions, with your feelings, with your forgiveness. Be generous. Don Sewell is a, a health care administrator in Texas. He's a, a faithful Baptist. I've known of him or about him my, my whole life. He was, he was recognized a few years ago for using his position as a health care administrator to distribute medical supplies all over the world, surplus supplies that would otherwise have been thrown away, distributed to people in need all over the world for his work. He received an award. As he was accepting his award, he told this story to illustrate what motivates his work. He said one morning he was sitting at the breakfast table with his son, about six years old. He and his son sitting there at the breakfast table. He was getting ready to go to work. His son was getting ready to go to school. He said as usual, they had the newspaper sitting on the kitchen table between them as they ate their cereal together. He said his son took the newspaper and started looking at the front page. He's trying to make out what it said. He's only six years old. He can't read all that well, but he can see the pictures, and he's trying to figure it out. After a while, he looks up at his dad and says, Dad, what does it say? What does the paper say today? Don says he looked at the paper, looked at it article by article. He said, well, well, this story is about a car wreck across town yesterday. As a couple people were killed and families are hurting. He said, this, this article is about the war. Son, we have troops in the Middle East. Some of them were killed. This is a report of that. This one's about City Hall. Looks like someone's embezzled money that was meant to go to a, a city program somewhere. Don said, I quit after that. I just looked at my son and said, that's just kind of the way the, the world is, son. There's a lot of hurt out there. Don said his son surprised him. So my six-year-old son looked up at me, a look of wide-eyed, innocent astonishment at what I just told him. He looked me square in the eye and he said, Daddy, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Oh, for that childish kind of naivete to think that we can walk out of our doors each morning and do something about what's going on in the world. Let me let you in on a secret. We can. We can walk out our doors each morning and make a difference in the world. Be generous to others as God has been generous to you. Be merciful as God is merciful. Be compassionate as God has been compassionate to you. Be forgiving and gracious as God has been forgiving and gracious to you. And you'll make a difference in the world. Look at the headlines this morning. What are we going to do about it? Jesus never said, be comfortable. Never said, be fair. Be generous. don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God may be doing in your life or in your heart. And we give you a specific time at the end of worship to do just that right where you sit. That's my invitation to you this morning. If you have a decision that you'd like to make publicly, I'd be honored to meet you at the front as we sing together.
seated for just one second, please. Not you, Joe and Lynn. Y'all come stand next to me. This is Joe and Lynn Mathis. I told them I'd introduce them, but uh, they don't really need an introduction. They've been worshiping with us for some time now. Joe's a retired Baptist pastor and a great churchman. Lynn is in our choir almost all the time. Um, we're very grateful for the ways you already contribute to our congregation. We're honored this morning to have a chance to welcome you officially to our fellowship. If you would welcome Joe and Lynn with me as new members of this church, I'd invite you to make that known by saying amen. amen. Welcome Joe and Lynn. I'd invite you both to stay right here after worship. Let everybody come by and say hello to you and welcome you in an official way. Uh, before we go today, just let me say once again to the fathers in the room, happy Father's Day. My dad's here somewhere. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Um, and to please remember our youth missions team this week in your prayers. They're in Wyoming now. They'll spend the week there and they'll be traveling home next weekend. Remember them and the work they'll do and pray for safe travels and safe return home for them. I'm very grateful for all, to all of you for being here this morning and I'll remind you as I do most weeks that I hope you'll leave this time of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives of this church and our Lord Jesus Christ. I would invite you now to stand again with me for our benediction. Depart now in peace, and as you go, may the good Lord shine a light on you. Make every song you sing your favorite tune. May the good Lord shine a light on you, warm like the evening sun.